Hello and welcome to Transforming Tomorrow, the podcast from the Pentland Centre for Sustainability in Business here at Lancaster University Management School. I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jan Bevington. Jan, we've kicked the economists out of the room. They were with us twice last week and we've brought back in your favourite kind of people. Yes, we have a colleague from Accounting and Finance back with us today and in particular from the discipline of finance, which we'll find out a lot more about. Yes, that's Professor Mark Shackleton, who is a Professor of Finance in the Department of Accounting and Finance. Finance, finance, finance. Not accounting, accounting, accounting today, so that's good. His specialty and research area covers things such as environmental, social and governance, law seal to investing, similar things like that. And we'll be talking to him lots of things about markets, investing, investor behaviour. Welcome, Mark. Hello, thank you for inviting me. I guess we'd like to start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and the kind of research areas that you look at. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, So my first training was in physics, and I entered the city at a time when they needed people who could do some numbers and who could work with computers, so the Big Bang was just coming along. To my discredit as a physicist, I succumbed to temptation, and I switched over, and I spent four years in banking. Um, After that, I was still interested to know more about general business, so I did an MBA, and I also did spend a short amount of time in consulting, but then I got really serious about academia and about teaching and research, did a PhD in finance as a specialism, and pretty much for all my career, I've been here as a faculty member since. Before we go on, what did you do in physics and why are you no longer a physicist? And why did you betray your brethren? Well, indeed, it's a very good question. I still try and follow physics and, of course, it's the queen of the sciences because almost all physicists believe that uh, the physics is out there to be discovered and what they do can't influence the, 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 phys- the physical, physical world and there's still so much that physicists don't, don't know and the cosmos and the James Webb Space Telescope now is still reviewing, revealing phenomenal things about the universe at a very, very early age. So I still find that, that fascinating. And the idea that you can work on something that is out there that won't change when you study is really attractive. Because, of course, in finance, what we study and what we learn about markets changes the way they evolve. So it's an ever-moving target. Mark's been added to my list of people from the management school whose background have absolutely nothing to do with management. Yeah. But I think there was another term in there that Bobby bears um, explanation. I I asked this quite early on in my stay here um, when somebody said about the city. I said, which city? (laughs) Which is... (laughs) So that's that's a very good question with historical interest. So obviously people know London. Um, And if you ask them who the mayor of London is, back in the day they would have um, thought about the GLC and the uh, City Hall, which is um, by the Thames. But in fact, the institution of the City of London, or the so-called Square Mile or the Corporation of London, is a much older entity that evolved as a um, body of guilds, specialist trade trade guilds, um, livery, carpentry, etc., silversmiths, and they had their own uh, industry associations. They brought banking into that. And then, of course, uh, famously, um, they've actually financed our our kings and queens throughout the regime um, in times of war. And actually, the monarch does not have the right to enter the city of London without the city of London's permission. And every year there's an annual ceremony where the monarch will go to the boundary of the city wall in order to be allowed to enter. So actually, classically, the mayor of London on a one-year rotating cycle is one of the senior members of these guilds. And they wear the hat and ride the carriage, etc. And they, through the body of guilds, are responsible for the city of London, which is a corporation um, at least four or five hundred years old. Yeah, it's amazing, ancient history, and has its own you know, jurisdiction, its own yes. rules, its, Poli- own, its own police force, own tax regimes. It's really amazing. Exactly. Uh, surprisingly amazing. Exactly. It's a bit awkward for the king if, you know, there's some roadworks on the road that goes just past <laughs> the city of London, but um, the diversion goes into the city, and he goes, no, no, we'll, we'll have to go all the way south of the river now. And this so is you'll it. find the boundary markers in London, studs in, in, the, in, in the wall, and you'll find the dragon. So if you see a dragon with a white and shield with a red cross of, of St George, that that marks the boundaries of the city of London. Yeah, I've seen them on bridges. Well, there we are, the things we find out about history when we're looking at yeah. other things. It's still not quite Queen of the Elder. That's true, that's true. He's, he's still not getting over that. So to help our listeners understand where somebody who studies finance comes from and how they see the world, what does the field of finance entail? So I started out more at the mathematical end, which is where my skill base was of value at the time. And as I said, there was a computer sitting on a desk and I arrived and someone said, well, do you know how to switch that on? Yes, I do. And off, off I went. For me, that, that was unknown. Finance has to deal with uncertainty. It has to deal 
with projects whose re- re- return realization is not yet known. It has to deal with um, statistics and econometrics, some things which your pr- previous economist uh, speakers may have referred to. So my core skills were well aligned with that. The social purpose of finance is to match those people who have spare capital or want to invest it with those people who are short of capital and need capital to invest in projects which they think are both worthwhile financially and today we're going to talk about socially. This activity emerged in uh, coffee houses in Holland and Amsterdam and in, in the UK and those investors who had made an investment but wished to realize their investment would meet with others over a cup of coffee and they would arrange for the buying and selling of their investments. Uh, This became developed, it eventually became regulated, but that's where the stock exchange activities first arose and and trade formal trading developed out of that. So you need individuals who can deal with data, up-to-date data. These prices change quickly. You have more data than you can physically handle, so you need people who can work with computing. You need people who can work with models of uncertainty and statistics and also who can work with the mathematical models of, of, of valuation, of which, of which there, there are many. Within all of that then, where do you fit? Where does your kind of work fit into that? So historically, I worked with more mathematical aspects and I worked with options, which are contingent claims. They're slightly more difficult to value, but there's a well-known methodology for that, which has actually attracted international recognition and, for instance, no, Nobel Prizes. That's more, more mathematical, and I've gravitated out, out of that as my math brain um, has lessened. But now I'm focusing in on investments which have climate impact, because for me as a physicist, it's very easy to read a climate report or, or a physics report. And so I know a lot about energy and carbon uh, from my prior training. And so I'm able to combine that skill with my finance knowledge. We're going to talk about then sustainability. We're going to talk about in the environment, how that fits in with investors. Do investors give a damn about sustainability or are they just all about the money? Well, that's a very good question. That in some sense is the key, the key question in the area. And I suspect that the average answer you get from an individual would depend a lot upon their age. For those of us who were brought up thinking that growth would go on forever and where there was no discussion about um, if and when the population would ever peak or people thought there'd be some catastrophic event, it was all about making, making money. But if you talk to younger investors now, they may not know their investors, but they are through their pension funds. But certainly if you talk to the younger people who are going to experience the climate for a longer period of time than the older folk, they have concerns about the environment and the climate and the planet, which they um, often express through the choice of their investments. So we're going to get more into the detail now about what drives investment returns. But attitudes towards where the positive or negative impact of my investment really will be felt are now starting actually to be to be to be present in in the younger generation. And of course, it's their investments which will sustain the economy into the far distant future and will actually determine the emissions over the second half of the century. So if you've got these younger investors who do want to make more conscientious choices, where are they getting the data from to inform their decisions? Is the data out there for them to be able to know? that what they're investing in is good, for want of a better word. So you're right to ask the question as to whether or not um, people matter and how how they're going to make make decisions. There are actually plenty of advisors in the financial arena who are pretty neutral on whether or not it's a good or bad thing to do or whether it can make a difference or not. But actually, despite their neutrality, they're actually willing and keen to embrace metrics, numbers, decision-making variables which determine uh, climate impact because even if they don't necessarily believe it'll make an impact, they know that in the future people will be tracking these variables and they know that others are interested in these variables. So we see a lot of professional management firms who even five, ten years ago wouldn't have expressed a strong view on the environment but they've almost been forced to adopt it because of a marketing position and because if this is going to become an important data area, they want access to the data, arguably they want control over the data sets and they want, they want branded products and data sets in the environmental, social and governance area of ESG. Is there a little bit of self-interest in that from the, uh, the brokers, the investment? <laughs> Everybody in finance um, has their own self-interest. They are selling a product, they're hoping people will buy that product. 
And the very best um, investment advisors will make it clear when their interest is or is not aligned with their clients through conflict of interest de- declarations. It's quite difficult to find neutral parties in this game, and everyone has an interest. And the buyer of a product is expected to recognize that and know that and take this into account when taking advice. And there are quite strong compliance directives as to how and when you can't offer advice. Nothing I say today could be taken as investment advice. <laughs> Um, and curses, so, Jan, curses. <laughs> yes, exactly. These are the means through which the industry meets its compliance regulatory um, statutes and also keeps itself honest um, because you're right, people are selling a product and a service and they want their product and service to succeed. Whilst um, our listeners who might be interested in sustainability in business, so might think it's perfectly normal or natural to think about um, environment, social and governance factors. Some people don't. And so there's certainly, as ESG has become more mainstream, there's been a bit of a backlash. And not not only, but crucially in the USA, there's been a a backlash into ESG. So what's at play with that backlash? Why do people feel grumpy about ESG investing? So uh, classically, the um, economists out of the Chicago school would uh, declare that a company's objective is to maximise the return for their shareholders and shareholders alone. So they wouldn't necessarily take a balanced scorecard across all stakeholders. They would say a company's job is to, within the competitive environment, maximise the return for its shareholders. This is 1950s, 1960s economists, uh, Milton Friedman, and others from the Chicago School. But of course, as the influence of business has grown in, in the world... Uh, we now understand that business is not um, thriving, just thriving within the ecosystem, but business is actually shaping and determining the ecosystem. And therefore, uh, the current re- realization, which is not Friedman, but which is Freeman, is that companies must pay attention to the ecosystem in which they operate because excess competition can cause them to destroy the, inv- the, the ecosystem in which they operate. And some of the financial excesses and frauds we see are arguably a function of excess competition. So now we have a broader understanding of global businesses' impact upon the planet and upon society. There are investors who are saying, yes, I care about my financial return. I care about the fact that my pension will have enough money to pay me a salary in my retirement. But... I additionally care about what the climate and the world will look like when I retire, because if it's hot and expensive to live in, then my my pension salary might not be enough. And this really broad, balanced stakeholder view in court, including non-fiduciary interests in the company, non-shareholders, is quite modern. It's of our time. And some people in finance are struggling to adapt to this idea. And what's their objection to it? So I think that their custom practice is embedded in a prior way of thinking. So it's disruptive to their prior way of thinking. Their network and knowledge skill um, is not adapted to this. And therefore, it's a threat to their business practices. And additionally, it's probably arguably harder work and more sophisticated and and involves a a broader set of conversations than just a conversation with your shareholders about the dividend. I know I brought up politics in the last episode, so I'm going to bring up politics in this one. We're recording just before a general election, but this episode will actually be going out. You'll be hearing this just after a general election here in the UK. Is there a politics element to it as well when it comes to the finance industry and depending upon which party is in power in whichever particular country you're in and their attitudes towards and ESG issues as well. For sure. And just as I mentioned that the City of London uh, had financed our monarchs for battles, uh, the City of London has been very important to governments even um, in other than in, time, in times of war because of tax revenues and what uh, and the city's ability to finance it, what, what, what they're, going, they're going to finance. Clearly, it's a money issue, so it more historically aligns with the right rather than the left interest, and the Labour governments have had a, a less easy relationship with the city, maybe with the exception of the Blair government, the Blair and Brown, Brown gov- government. Um, so yes, it is, it is political. Governments are having difficulty holding to their commitments and promises in terms of climate, and we want to hold them to account on that and not backtrack. Their credibility and how they, their ability to follow through will be, will be tested. But I think if you want a very practical example, one of the first things that might kind of come up front and central uh, for the next government would be whether or not continuing fossil fuel investment should be tax preferred and tax exempt and enjoy write downs. So that's actually being discussed now as to whether or not the removal of that would be a good thing. 
clearly it would accelerate investment in green assets even more and it would pre- prevent the continuation of, of fossil fuels. But that's a political item which could be on the agenda. And I suppose what's interesting there is, um, and you mentioned it earlier, is that stock exchanges are one of the key means by which people exchange ownership rights in organisations and companies. But they themselves are a social entity that has a, their own rules. They decide how who's going to be in, who's going to be out, what kind of um, data yes. is required. Yes. Do stock exchanges have a view about environmental matters? And stock exchanges are also subject to their own forms of competition. Yeah. So they don't operate um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a vacuum. So uh, just this week, uh, we've seen that the fashion retailer Shein, S-H-E-I-N, which looked sought for a listing in New York, which would involve a higher level of disclosure, is now, con- is now considering whether or not it could have a listing in the UK with different levels of disclosure. So companies will shop around stock exchanges for um, the one which will allow them to list, and stock exchanges are trying to hold to their uh, criteria in terms of um, holding companies to a, to a, to a, to account. From humble beginnings in, in coffee shops, they've grown to hugely powerful entities, and about half of global business is listed on global stock exchanges. We know we know the biggest in New York, arguably not London now. I mean, people talk about Frankfurt, and clearly the big exchanges in Asia and. Based uh, stock exchange took a big hit with the politics of this of this week. So these are very powerful entities because they provide access and they're they're providing a gatekeeper role to large sums of capital and to increased sums of for, for financing. So they have a very important role, and which companies they deem to be compliant for listing purposes uh, will determine which projects find easiest, most attractive funding. And also they'll determine which are easiest for pension funds to invest in. So when you say it makes it easier to find investment, so if I'm listed on a stock exchange, it changes the number, well, the the array of people that can buy and sell my shares. Does that mean that I will get more money as a company or does it mean I'll be thought better of so I can borrow more money? A bit of both. So the more people who invest in your company, the more diverse diverse that shareholder base. So um, it'll provide some stability. You want a broad range of shareholders so that um, they're stable. Also, arguably, it gives them less power over you rather than having one large shareholder body. And if your strategy is to become a global corporation in terms of your product, having a global shareholder base is co-aligned with that strategy. I was a strange child, Jan, you won't be surprised to learn. But I, I had a strange obsession with the, all the stock markets around the world, the Nikkei, the Hang Seng, the Dow Jones, the FTSE. I'd always look in the newspapers every day. I, I must have been eight, nine, ten. And it made no difference to my life at all, but I was always paying attention to them and see, <laughs> see, seeing that. And I, I always remember that the, the Dow Jones was the one and also, yeah, the Nikkei was up there and then, yeah, there was one. Yeah, Frankfurt was never there as a child, but I suppose that speaks a lot to the current uh, geopolitical and economic situation across Europe and everything that ties in with that. With regards to stock exchanges, though, I'm thinking back to a long time ago when we spoke to Mahmoud Gad and we spoke to him about modern slavery reporting and what companies had to disclose with regards to modern slavery, how they disclose them in the reports, how this might affect investors in them. So that's where I'm starting to think now of sustainable investment funds and whether people are looking at them, using them, investing in them more than they did previously and the effect, the impact that they might have on stock markets and how stock markets perform. So there are some investors, uh, particularly younger investors, who believe that um, environmentally, socially governance compliant firms, ESG compliant firms, uh, represent the growth sector and the next wave of, of, of capitalism and therefore investing in it will give growth. There are another older group of investors who believe that the costs of mitigation for environmental damage will cause ESG stocks to underperform. So the tension between the Friedman Freeman views are still there and will probably not will probably not 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 go away. But of course, capitalism doesn't uh, stay still. It um, always always moves on, and no business has got a right to exist in per- in perpetuity. Uh, fossil fuels have been around for more than 100 years, but it was the 1940s economist Joseph Schumpeter who pointed out that every capitalist entity has to be concerned about what he called creative destruction. And one person's business as usual, their business segment, is another person's opportunity. And therefore, without getting into the issue about 
um, climate and the moral aspect of, say, climate to climate investing. The energy sector and the oil sector has always been ripe for being replaced by something. And the fact that renewables are now very cost competitive means that the oil industry has had its time and the energy generation segment is moving on to solar and wind. And in terms of raw energy cost, renewables now are very competitive. The area in which they don't yet perform as well as fossil fuels is they are intermittent and the energy is difficult to store. So fossil fuels are both very convenient because you can just they come out of the ground. And secondly, the fuel will wait for you until you use it. Electricity is not, is not, not, not like that. So in answer to your question, part of what's driving the ESG movement now, even in America and even in Texas, is the cost efficiency of, of, of renewables. And for some people, that's the prime concern and the climate benefit is a secondary concern. But the world changes. Capitalism can't take anything for granted. And business segments come and go, and the oil segment is on de- in decline. And that's the second mention we've had of Texas and two, <laughs> two I, I, consecutive I d- podcasts. I dare say free in free podcasts, because I, 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 oh, I think yes. Dax Sheena probably mentioned Texas in yeah. both of the podcasts yeah. we had with him recently yeah. on both the economics of pollution, environmental impact yeah. of industry, etc., and on consumer spending. Yeah, he, he seemed to spend a lot of time in Texas. Yes. <laughs> um, what you've spoken about there, uh, if you like, with the idea of creative destruction and you know, sectors coming and going, are more sort of like the rolling over of business sectors in the long run sort of business history. But there's also shareholder activism, yes. where maybe a group of shareholders are looking to press a company to do a particular thing. Could you tell us more about yeah. that? Yeah, so if you have a large strategic or a voting block in a, in a company, then your your vote is important. And if a proxy vote in that company's um, processes comes up, then you can exert a lot of influence. So if you set about accelerating the decline of um, oil or fossil, fossil fuels, you have arguably two alternatives. You can hold a stake and you can go to shareholder meetings and vote for those resolutions which move the company towards the green. Hydrogen, green energy, solar, etc. Um, ammonia could be a future fuel, that's carbon free. Plenty of funds, maybe arguably including USS, which is the university's fund in which we're invested, will we'll do this and at the margin for those resolutions that come along, they will choose the one they think that suits their pensioner base. If you reach a limit on that and or you have, have insufficient influence, you may say, well, I can't influence it, so what should I do? Other people say, at that point, you should divest and you should sell your interest in that stock. That, in some sense, makes it someone else's problem to do the voting. And you may, at the margin, be transferring the ownership to someone who's got a different view and may be going to give the company an easier ride in that particular uh, dimension. But in fact, you may also be making the company less marketable because, of course, if everyone takes the same view as you that they're going to divest, then the share price will go down until a point at which it is sufficiently low to attract net new investors. So there has been a big wave of divestment in oil oil companies, and they are no longer viewed as the growth segment. They are profitable whilst the oil price is high. They are paying high dividends off the back of high oil price, but they're not the growth area. And some pension fund investors will choose stocks for their high yield. But in fact, most of them want to choose stocks that have growth. And most individual investors are interested in stocks that are growing, not not stocks that are declining. As well as divestment, do you also have the aspect of shareholder revolts, whereby you have blocks of shareholders who are vocally, publicly, making sure that everyone knows about it, voting against what the or, or for the company may be recommending to the shareholders to vote for. Yes, and their actions are probably uh, most keenly felt at time of takeover. So if the company can't keep such shareholder blocks on board when times are difficult and the share price is low, then um, companies might be subject to takeover by a new management with a new direction. Now, some of the oil majors are segueing into renewable energies very quickly, I think the French company Total Energies has probably done that quickest. Some of the American companies uh, are doing that more slowly. And some of the American companies in particular might be the last holders of oil assets. They might be the buyers of last, last resort. So if the industry does decline and consolidate through consolidating mergers, 
then it's likely it'll consolidate around a couple of U.S. companies. But um, maybe the other fossil fuel firms will either divest and sell off their oil interests or switch into green energy. And that's very similar to the two decades that tobacco experienced in the 80s and 90s, when it became clear that their investments were, were going to become much less marketable to pension funds. It's interesting you say there that it might well end up consolidated in America because you think of the huge companies such as Aramco, yes. Saudi Arabia, the IPO that was held there raised many, many millions, hundreds of millions, possibly even billions uh, of yes. dollars in, in investing yes. in, in that. But you don't necessarily see the, the countries that are maybe in OPEC that are the, the main oil producers, they might not necessarily be the countries that are holding out till the end. So the Saudi government still owned the majority interest of their, their company, Aramco. It was an American-found institution, but it's become part of the Saudi state over, over, over the decades. They had a goal and objective to achieve a $2 trillion listing in valuation. That's just a little bit out there when I said millions. <laughs> that's quite big. It's bigger than Apple and NVIDIA are top of the charts right now. Um but in fact, although they have a listing on the Riyadh stock exchange in Saudi currency, it's called the Tadawal Exchange, um, they actually weren't able to achieve a listing on a major international stock exchange like the US or Asia or, or, or London because of these restrictions that exchanges place on the sorts of investments they do and do not want to host. So despite its goals, the Saudi government has not yet managed to uh, divest itself of a significant stake of um, Aramco. It sold one stake. Uh, the next stake, we shall see what happens. But in fact, actually, that company may be on its own decarbonization portfolio. And of course, the Saudi region's got great access to solar. They can move into desalination projects using solar energy. So we'll keep them under under review. It's interesting. That. It, would it have been possible then that if Aramco, say, 50 to 60 years ago had tried to float, it may have found it easier because the attitudes of the stock exchange towards that type of business were, yeah, that's fine. But because of the changing attitudes of the markets now, that's made it more difficult. I think even 15 years ago, they might have managed to do that. When BP was still British Petroleum, they could have a rights issue. Um, then they became BP and went for an international listing. I think even in recent memory, time of memory, it's been easy for these companies to raise new investment the Saudi company also has got governance issues, and another issue was the size of the stake. The stock exchanges didn't want a small minority stake. They wanted to know a large stake was traded, whereas the Saudi government wanted to release their blocks of equity um, over, 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 over time. But these are the sorts of factors alongside ESG which determine whether or not exchanges will or will not host large companies. I think what's coming through is um, like there's a real economy where people are digging for oil and gas or you know making clothing or making food or whatever but then there's the financial economy which is another sort of place where there's other markets and then another array of considerations about you know could you list could you raise the money etc. So but these two worlds intersect with each other in quite critical ways and sometimes in negative ways and sometimes in positive ways. So you know, there's more than one economy out there. It's impossible to separate society from everything else that's going on uh, around society. And I know this is something we discussed with The Economists in the recent episodes where it's not just about numbers and money. It's about the social aspects. It's about environmental aspects. It's about all other kinds of aspects that there are in the world. Mark Carney, who used to be the governor of the Bank of England, before that the governor of, of the Bank in Canada, quite an amazing figure and certainly has been hugely influential in thinking about climate change and its impact on stock exchanges. Instead of a tragedy of, of the commons, he talked about the tragedy of the horizon and really identified climate change as being a fundamental risk to financial stability. So, so that sounds quite bad, but what does it mean to be a risk to financial stability and whose financial stability are we talking about? Well, he was very clever because as a central banker, he knew how to talk to other central bankers and he knew how to to persuade them what risks should were were manifest and which, which which were not, and apart from the temperature risks associated with um, increased uh, carbon and business risks with trade patterns, he very ably made the case to his other colleagues that the world would be a more difficult place to manage from a banking super supervision perspective if the climate is hotter and if um, life is more difficult and if the economy is less predictable and less stable. 
Bankers like to measure things. They like to know um, what security they have against their loans. Um, they collect lots and lots of metrics and numbers against the collateral, which has been pledged against, against their loans. And they also want to know that those assets are future-proofed. They want to know that they're going to be unlikely to be written off or become redundant. And in a world where that can't be taken for granted, it was a relatively easy sell for him to persuade other central bankers that they, they should start monitoring the environmental credentials of the assets against which the loans are made. And, and therefore banking supervision now will embrace a range of climate metrics um, and upfront and central are carbon emissions. At the same time, that's a really nice link through to accounting as well. One of the things that came from Mark Carney and the Financial Stability Board's worry in this area is the requirement for corporations to provide information on their um, climate-related risks in mm-hmm. financial terms. And as, as sort of you get that knock-on between finance and accounting, which is why we're offered in, in same departments, because of that link between those two elements. And any mention of accounting always goes down well with you, of course, John. <laughs> so not, not to put all the pressure on you then, Mark, but what are you doing about all of this um, <laughs> when it comes to uh, corporate behaviour, when it comes to the future of the financial markets, when it comes to ESG, when it comes to low CO2 investing? What, what's your current work looking at? So I think the tension and debate between those people who are seeking ESG uh, growth and those people who are seeking to maximise the yield from legacy assets is not going to go away. I think um, that could be a positive force because it uh, stimulates both sides to raise their game and articulate their offering as strong as strongly as as, as, as they can. Uh, as I said, I've, I've got um, colleagues who believe that ESG will outperform. I've got others who believe that it uh, might be a cost drag and then lead to lead to underperformance. But irrespective of that, I think my message uh, to many investors is that. ESG assets will probably have a return, which is commensurate with their risk, just as oil assets and other assets will as well. But if you invest in something purposeful, and as well as your financial adequate return on average, if you're well diversified, if you get the sense that you're contributing to a positive future by investing in ESG compliant stocks, why would you not want to do that? So I'm really researching the difference between ESG compliant returns and those that are not. If I don't find an effect, I won't be disappointed in terms of financial returns because I will still have confidence that the environmental performance of compliant stocks will lead them to be more purposeful investment than the legacy stocks which we've been criticising. And do you feel positive that things are heading in the right direction? There's been pushback in the last two to three years, which I think you alluded to, particularly in, in in the U.S., any movement is going to period of reassessment and, and, and revision, so that's fine, I understand that. But I think that the move is established and is unstoppable. It can be braked for a period of time, but I don't, but I don't believe that um, it, can, it can be fully reversed. I think the youngsters who increasingly through their careers determine what we invest in will shape the future in a different way. I think that there will be a time in the future when they look back and... They ask us why it was ever considered to be acceptable that we could lend to oil firms or we could invest in oil firms in our, in our, in our pension fund. Some of the institutions we've mentioned, like the Stock Exchange, and I'll check this out, 1801, and also the insurance entity Lloyds of London, 1689, they both predated the formal and de facto abolition of slavery. And I can't get drawn into, it's not my expertise, I can't get drawn into the issue about reparation for, the, for, that, for that activity. But in those particular centuries, it would have been fairly okay or normal to have considered the financing of these now horrendous activities, which we look back on uh, with horror. And therefore, there will be a time when the oil industry will look differently from a historical lens compared to where, 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 where we are now but it's difficult to bring everyone on that journey and take them to that future time to look back. Mark, this has been wonderful. Thank you very much. It's been such a great conversation delving into the whole world of finance investing and how it can affect corporate behaviour and everything around sustainability. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Jan, next time we're going to be looking at salmon. 
Ah, more fishy things. Yes, fishy things. Yes, very fishy things. Everything on the, about this podcast is fishy. <laughs> well, this is particularly so. Yes, we've got Dr. Josie Fernandez from the Department of Marketing, who's going to be here with us talking about the UK salmon industry, the sustainability challenges that that faces. So that's going to be a very interesting conversation too. Absolutely. Until then, thank you very much for listening to Transforming Tomorrow. I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jan Bebbington. Thank you.